are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. We are like trees planted by streams of water, who yield their fruit in the season, and whose leaves do not wither. The wicked are like chaff that the wind drives away. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Let us worship the Lord as we meditate on the word together. People of God, welcome home. <laughs>
in all of your mercy and in all of your grace, that your spirit would sweep over our hearts at this time of celebration, that you would renew our faith and strengthen our hands and our minds and our feet for your mission and for your ministry in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give thanks and we pray. Amen. Amen.
Georgia. May I get your help for a second? So we're going to give thanks for our church's birthday. And I forgot, if you're having a birthday, you have to have presents, right? So we have a small gift for each of you. And Courtney and Georgia can help me pass them out. They didn't know they got to be man white today. <laughs> Let's celebrate every day. And today we're going to celebrate our church's birthday. Birthdays are more than just presents. It's a time to be happy. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for celebration. And thank you for making every day special. Amen.
Let us pray. Sovereign God, let your word rule in our hearts and your spirit govern our lives until at last we see the fulfillment of your realm of justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen now for God's word as we have a reading from the Hebrew scriptures from one of the classical prophets, the prophet Isaiah. Um, listen now for God's word. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint.
Gospel according to Matthew in the 16th chapter. Listen again for God's word. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, um, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for my flesh, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. my mom, Norma Grewey, but you probably know her as well. <laughs> I want to thank the committee, and particularly Grace Millspa, and Mary Alice, and Donna, and John on the committee for inviting me here, and Chuck Snyder, who has been my, my dear friend for many, many years, and Alice, and all of the staff here, and Chris Stewart for your wonderful welcome. Uh, for allowing me to be here today, welcoming me back to a home. So, 200 years. What have y'all been doing over that time? <laughs> oh, wait, wait, I know. Feeding the hungry, providing clothing for those who have nothing, visiting the sick and those who are in prison, Offering living water to a world thirsting for that something that is lasting in this life. It's a big job. Big job. Sharing and singing and cooking and caring and living and teaching the love of God and Jesus Christ in this place and for this time and for the time to come. And what a wonderful day of looking forward to the future ahead. I know all of this because I've seen it over the years. I've felt it in my family in times of deep need. And I was one. I am one of those kids who learned it here in faith. That faith that abides, that lasts from when you're your age to when you get up to my age. <laughs> so good work. Good work, all of you. Our scripture reading from the New Testament this morning comes from the book of Second or First Peter, the second chapter, verses four through ten. Listen as together we hear the word of God. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. 
To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. And a stone that makes them stumble. A rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. Now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Would you pray with me? And for me. Dear Lord, on this morning that you have given us, grant us a word for our hearts, and hearts for your word. Amen. Many times in many conversations with people, I will hear folks tell, usually in glowing terms, about the life of their particular congregation. And they will refer to it as my church. My church helps the homeless. My church supports education with African students. My church has a wonderful music program. Now, there's a lot of benefit to believers who feel a strong connection and even a sense of ownership to a particular congregation, captured in the designation, my church. Pastors are as likely as anyone to use as this vernacular, perhaps more so than others. Yet there can be a danger in this kind of my language. We believers must never forget that this is Jesus Christ's church. The Matthew reading amplifies this fact. Christ called the church into being. He died for this church, redeemed it, and built it over the centuries. We have to remember that God has chosen us to be part of God's creative work in the world, and the instrument for that work is the church. God takes us from nothing into something. And often we are quite something. <clears throat> Let's consider how that works. One of the hallmarks of the Presbyterian Church and the Reformed tradition is that we do not choose our church. Rather, God has chosen us. It's known as irresistible grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about the household of God, with Christ as the cornerstone. In Him, we are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. A dwelling place for God. We are citizens with all the saints who have gone before us and are no longer strangers and aliens. We are connected. Like Jesus, the cornerstone, 1 Peter declares that we can be like living stones. Now, there are lots of stones in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus says that God is able from these stones to lift up children as to Abraham. And there was a stone, you may remember, that Moses struck and water poured forth for the people. There was a stone in the Old Testament that Jacob used as a pillow. Jacob used a stone for a pillow when God spoke to him in a dream at Bethel. And he was on his journey far away from home. Kind of reminds me of me. But which also reminded me of the le legend of the Blarney Stone in Ireland, which is support purported to be that same pillow that Jesus... That Jesus, that Jacob used. And in a sense, that Blarney stone is a living stone. It has a story and a legacy for those who have kissed the Blarney stone, including me. But I digress. <clears throat> the point is that we can be living stones. We can build, be built up into Christ's church. 
And we have been. Over the generations, the church is not this or that building project or addition or renovation or even location. The first church, the brick church, the present church as we proudly remember. The church is, has been, and always will be, as the cherub choir reminded us, the church will be the people. The church is a living organism. While we may be organized, we are not, first of all, an organization. We are more of a, of a covenant clan. I'm reminded of the crusty fellow who, when invited to a church worship service, said, ah, I don't believe in organized religion. And the church member who invited him responded, well, then you'll like it at the Presbyterian church. We've been trying to get organized for 200 years, and we haven't gotten there yet. The dynamic in 1 Peter is telling. Verse 5 says, like living stones, let yourself be built up into a spiritual house. 1 Peter then goes on to a pattern of dichotomies, honored or shamed, believing or disbelieving, chosen or rejected, taken from nothing and built into something. A few years ago, there was a worship service held at Union Seminary in New York, where Joe Engel, whose dad I knew in this church, was a benefactor. And the worship service was planned and led by homeless people. One of the students had worked in a, in a homeless organization and had gotten to know the people there and their plight. And the worship service came about when they realized that many of the folks buried on Hart Island the indigent cemetery for New York City never had a memorial service, never even had a name on their graves. So this worship service came about, and many of the participants could not even read. So they memorized their parts, and they all worked very hard to get things just right. The service began and was led with power and with grace. They read the story of Lazarus and the rich man, and they prayed, and they sang. And they added the stories from their own lives. And then at the close of the service, the participants were asked to write down, all of the people in the congregation write down the name of a homeless person on a purple post-it note. Names like Robert or Sharon were added along with names of John Doe and Jane Doe and baby doe. And they had a large sheet stretched between two poles, two candle stands at the front of the chapel. But as you may know, and Aaron, you might have tried this, it's kind of hard to get post-it notes to stick on the fabric. And Elizabeth, one of the organizers, went back again and again, picking up the post-it notes off the floor and putting them up again to put the names in seemingly random spots on this sheet. And she did not sit down until every name was back up in place and visible to all. No name was left out. And when they were all represented, it was then the people and the worshipers discovered that the anonymous names had not been placed randomly. The purple post-its on the cloth spelled out the words, we are here. We are here even if we were buried without names. We are here even though people ignore us on the streets. Once we were not a people. Now we are God's people. And we are here. God hears the cries of God's people in distress. God acts to rescue us in every kind of trouble and need. God enters into a covenant with us to be God's people together. And that covenant makes us the church. That is faith of the ages. We know that God chooses all kinds of people. And this reading from 1 Peter passage, we cannot imagine God's actions in the world apart from God's relationship with the depth and breadth and height 
varying heights of all of God's people, the whole family of God. Charles Plum, a U.S. Naval Academy graduate, was a jet fighter pilot in Vietnam. After 75 combat missions, his plane was destroyed by a surface-to-air missile. And Plum ejected and parachuted into enemy hands. He was captured and spent six years in a communist prison. He survived that ordeal and now lectures about lessons he learned from that experience. And one day when Plum and his wife were sitting in a restaurant, a man at another table came up and said, You're Plum. You flew jet fighters off of the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. You were shot down. And Plum asked, how in the world did you know that? I packed your parachute, the man replied. And Plum, Plum gasped in surprise and gratitude. And the man shook Plum's hand and said, I guess it worked. <laughs> Plum said, it sure did. If your shoot hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here today. And Charles Plum could not sleep that night, thinking about that man. Plum says, I kept wondering how many times I might have passed him on the Kitty Hawk, and not even knowing his name, not even saying good morning, or how are you, or anything, because you see, I was a fighter pilot, and he was just a sailor. Plum thought of the many hours that sailor had spent on a long wooden table in the bowels of the ship, carefully weaving the shrouds and folding the silks of each parachute, holding in his hands each time the fate of someone he did not know. And now Plum asks his audiences, who's packing your parachute? Life is a collective endeavor, and everyone has someone who provides what they need to make it through the day. There are days when we are the fighter pilot and days when we are packing the parachutes. What the author of 1 Peter is doing is shaping the identity of the people of the church of his day. Once we were rejected, but now we are chosen. Once we were ashamed of what we had, of what we could do, but now we are honored as a foundation of our society. Once we were no people, and now, now we are God's people. That is faith for today. We will know rejection, just as Jesus knew rejection. The question becomes, will that identity with Jesus become a stumbling block for us, an obstacle to our faith? Or, or is Jesus the cornerstone? The rock, the foundation of our lives. The grace and mercy in this identity as God's people is the belief, the reassurance that we do not have to change the world. We do not own the church. We have only to let ourselves be built into the spiritual house that is a dwelling place for God. That is the work Christ is doing in the world. Our house, our true home, is God's house. And the God who created the world at a word from nothing is still creating today. We want to be a part of what God is doing in the world today. That is our true home. I'll never forget when our family visited Kansas. Anna, my daughter, was a child. And I had never seen where Susan, my wife, had grown up, where all these family stories and lore had taken place. And so we visited Hutchinson, Kansas, and hunted down the addresses of the houses where her family had lived. There was one house where her grandparents had lived. It was a modest house in a typical neighborhood, but it was obvious from the view from the street that, that the people, the occupants, were letting it go. It needed a paint job, it needed a good weeding, and there were boxes and various items left strewn on the front porch. There was no name on the mailbox, not even a post-it note. And then we visited the church where Susan's grandparents had attended, where they belonged. It was a well-kept building, and when we went inside, you could 
hotel, it was well used throughout the week. There was a history room with pictures, and Susan found pictures of uncles and, well, mostly uncles in that day, <laughs> who were uh, stern-looking men in uncomfortable-looking over-starched shirts and black coats on the deacons and committees of the church. We introduced ourselves, and one of the ladies in the church office said that she had remembered Susan's grandmother, and that they still had a church cookbook printed as a fundraiser dedicated to her grandmother, Esther DeWater. And there, as we went down to the church kitchen, where her grandmother had spent so many hours, there was a plaque with Esther's name on it. We had found her true home. Of course, it was, really was nothing Esther had done or built or made or even cooked that stood the test of time. It was what God was doing, what God is still doing in that building, in that place that makes it a living temple to the one called out of darkness into marvelous light. That is faith for tomorrow. There may be nothing darker than the shadow of death. Perhaps you've heard the story of Sophia Sanchez, the little girl in Chicago on the transplant list, who needed a new heart. She made news when the popular singer Drake came to visit her in the hospital. And there is a viral video with Sophia dancing down the hospital hallways in her hospital gown. And at that time, she said she wanted, she had two wishes. One was to meet Drake, her favorite singer. And oh, she also wanted a new heart. Well, within two weeks, both wishes came true. Because the week after Drake's visit to her in the hospital, the nurses and the doctors and the organ bank clerical workers, the parachute hackers of medicine, found a new heart for Sophia. But what struck me about this story was the end and a new beginning, much like this church. Evidently, during her transplant, when the heart surgeon placed the heart gently into Sophia's chest, he spoke to the heart, and he said to it, welcome to your new home. This is my church, my home. This is where my heart is. But it's not of my doing or any of our doing. This is God's house. This is Christ's body, the church doing Christ's work in the world today. This is where God's spirit finds welcome. And we are blessed, each one of us in every age, to be members of this. People of God, welcome home. Please join me in prayer. God, we thank you for the church, the people who have made such a lasting gift in our lives and through whom we can be a gift in the days to come.
by using an ancient creed of the Church, uh, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He descended into heaven. Is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We move in our order of worship today to give thanks to God. Uh, we come to that portion whereby uh, ordinarily in the order we pray, we have the prayers of the people. Uh, in light of the special occasion today, uh, I'm utilizing a resource for these prayers that comes from the Book of Common Worship uh, in our denomination that was newly released uh, in just May of this year. Uh, it's from a portion of the book that's entitled Celebrating a Congregation's Anniversary. As I read through this, I thought it was a no-brainer uh, to use this uh, in our worship today. And as you so beautifully sang uh, the, um, the song of antiphonally with the response, I'm going to suggest, while it's not printed, uh, that when I extend my hand, that the response be, We give you thanks, O God. Let us pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, hear our prayer. For the church universal and for this congregation of your people, we give you thanks, O God. For this place in which we gather for praise and prayer, witness and service, in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord, we give you thanks, O God, for your presence among us. Whenever your word has been proclaimed, your sacramental gifts of bread and wine shared, we give you thanks, O God, for those who have been made your children by adoption and grace, who in this place were cleansed of sin buried with Christ in the waters of baptism, and raised to new life and eternal life, we give you thanks, O God, for disciples young and old who have been nurtured here in faith. We give you thanks, O God, for all who have come here asking for your blessing in marriage, seeking to love with your love, we give you thanks, O God, for deacons, elders, and pastors who have led and loved us and by the offering of their gifts equipped us for the work of ministry. We give you thanks, O God, for faithful stewards among us who have lived for others, serving you by loving neighbors. We give you thanks, O God, for all the same who have stood among us, whose memory still enlivens our faith and emboldens our witness. We give you thanks, O God, for the ministries of worship and mission, nurture and fellowship, and for all whose lives have been touched by them. We give you thanks, O God. Receive our gratitude, Holy God, for the years through which you have led us and open us to the future you promise in the years that lie ahead grant us your encouragement in the work of ministry your consolation in our defeats and your challenge to our complacency give us such trust in your abiding spirit that we may find joy and peace in our common life, strength and courage to live in the world for your reign 
and hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of God's children, shall we together pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank mm -hmm. you. 